Hey, what's up, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Let There Be Talk. Today is Monday, December 18th, and I hope you guys are all doing good. Yes, did you have a good weekend? I had a great weekend, a bunch of shows, all kinds of great shows. I did a I did four shows on Friday. And man, I, I love I love what I did. And then uh, three last night, which is incredible. Did the uh, Bill Hicks celebration at the comedy store. It's just it's just unbelievable to uh just just if you if you haven't watched Bill Hicks ever or you don't know who Bill Hicks is or you do and you haven't watched him in a long time, Bill Hicks to me is like a classic great record. It stands the test of time. His comedy is still it's still relevant today. You know, I think that's the hardest thing about doing comedy. And uh, I think about it and I learn so much from uh, people like Bill Hicks and uh, Marin and, and Burr and stuff. It, there's, there's like two types of comedy to me. There's comedy that's funny. Yeah, this guy's very funny. But then there's a comedy where a comedian is funny and he's saying something. And to me, that is the goal you want to get to. At first, when I started comedy, yeah, I want to be funny. That's all you're trying to figure out. How can I be funny? Uh, How can I make strangers in a room laugh? And then realizing later, I, I've, you know, from people I, I love watching and, and, and talking to people, you realize, you go, wow, it's not really about being funny. Yeah, it is. You want to be funny, but you want to be saying something too. And uh, that's known in the business as uh, he knows his voice, his jokes are his voice. Uh, and that's what Bill Hicks is. You know, I went back over the weekend and just listened to Bill Hicks and watched Bill Hicks stuff on YouTube again. And every time I do that, I dive down that rabbit hole about once a year. Hey, it's like once a year I I do the same thing. It's like watch Bill Hicks specials. Check out Godfather, Apocalypse Now, Saturday Night Fever, and Jaws. <laughs> you know, drugstore cowboy. Uh and then um You know, listen to uh, animals, Pink Floyd animals for one month straight. Kind of loony shit like that, that re-inspires me every time over and over to kick me in the ass of try to be better and um, and try to, uh, you know, try to try to try to do comedy with my voice. So anyway, Bill Hicks, get into that, people and enjoy it. There's a. There's a couple bits. Every, I know the bits, and every time they come up, I go, oh, God, I love this one. And, and one of them is about the Kennedy assassination. And, and as he, uh, I went to uh, the, the, the place, you can go there in Dallas, and you can go up into the library where the uh, supposed, if you want to get into the conspiracy theories, the supposed of, uh, shots were fired. And, uh, you know, I just love Bill Hicks bit on that and many, many bits that he had. And it's it's uh, it's great to uh, if you've never seen the documentary out, I highly recommend that. I don't know where you can see it now. I'm sure iTunes has it. Uh, Look around for that, though, and check that out. It's called Bill Hicks uh, American, the Bill Hicks story. And uh, I'm sure it's, uh, it might be on iTunes, but I, I like to look this up. It came out in 09, which is very interesting because it came out right when I started comedy. And I, I remember uh, being so into it. And I was asked to do this uh, show at the store years ago, the first time around when the family was uh, screening the documentary and they were having a celebration and I remember Mac Lindsay and I and a few others uh, were on the show. I can't remember if I did comedy or 
I think I did. I don't know, man. It's eight years ago now. But I, I just remember just being so into it and, and watching uh, the real deal. Anyway, uh, what else is happening? All kinds of great stuff. Uh, got a brand new sponsor. Oh, man. Let me tell you, do you live in L.A.? And are you ever thinking about, you know, I talk about Porsche 911s nonstop, and I love Porsche. And, uh, you know, I think that there's a, a big misconception of, uh, oh, you get a European sports car, it's going to cost you a fortune, they're going to break down all the time. And a lot of them do, you know. You, you, you don't, you don't want to buy a Ferrari if you have no money. And you go, oh, get an old used Ferrari, which you can't do now. But I remember years back, maybe eight years ago, uh, I was in front of the comedy store and there was a, one of those Magnum PI Ferraris, the, the 308, and it was gold. It was this factory gold. And I was like, God, and it was for sale. And I was like, fuck, I could sell my motorcycles and buy that. And uh, not, not to be some fucking, oh, look at me, Ferrari. I'm a Ferrari guy. No, man, I fucking love Ferrari and Porsche. And, uh, you know, I don't care what people say. If you're into a fucking car and you, you are an enthusiast and absolutely love a car, you know, most of the time the hate slung at it is by people just uh, jealous. But if you legitimately love uh, a car, a make of a vehicle and you're not buying it because you're afraid what people will think, then that's just fucking soft. Anyway, my point is my new sponsor, TLG Auto. I had Marco on uh, about a year ago. He talked all things Porsche. I fell in love with this man. He is, this guy knows everything about a Porsche. It's, uh, he's been in the biz all his life, and his father was in the business. Uh, he's an independent Porsche service specialist, and he is in Los Angeles. And my point is, if you've ever wanted to buy a Porsche and you think it's a little scary and you're not quite sure uh, how to get into it, this is a good spot to go to if you want to get a car and have it inspected. Don't buy a car off Craigslist and just jump into it without getting a car inspected because you could be buying something that could be a complete nightmare. Or maybe you have a Porsche and you're a fan of my show and you just go to the dealer or whatever and fucking throw thousands away and not even, you know, thinking about it. Go see my boy Marco, TLG Auto. Check out their website, tlgauto.com. I am so happy to have him as a sponsor, man. I love to, uh, you know, this guy is definitely one of the kings of what I would say is handmade. Uh, he's one of my handmade episodes. So check it out, TLG, uh, tlgauto.com. Also check out the Instagram, tlg underscore auto. His Instagram is incredible. And he just got a pretty fucking badass dirt bike yesterday. Check it out. Anyway, thank you, Marco. You are the man. And also my other great sponsor, which is the one and only, uh, only the one and only singer for, for Lynch Mob. No, that's not my sponsor. My sponsor is the one and only El Cajon Harley. Yes. It is Christmas time, and that means it's time to buy yourself a new motorcycle. Fuck yes, it is. Treat yourself. Get yourself a motorcycle, a 2018 Harley-Davidson. Do not go anywhere else. Hit up my boy, Greg Riley. Let's see what they got going there. They got all kinds of, uh, they got some specials going on right now for the holidays, and it is uh, Christmas time. Maybe you want to buy your friend a helmet. Or some uh, chaps. Uh, look at this. There's a, What do they got here? I'm looking at their specials. First of all, you can find them too. Go to ElCajonHarley.com. Get yourself. Oh, God, I love this new Harley that just came out. Uh, they just came out with this uh, soft tail sport glide. It's rad. It's like a Dyna with bags and, and a little fairing and massive power. Love it. Go check it. Ask them to ride it. Get a CVO. Get the Battleship Gray Road Glide CVO that I want so much. Or 
Go buy their last Dyna S. They have one left on the floor. It might be gone by the time this is out. Anyway, El Cajon Harley. Those are my sponsors. Uh, and we want to give a shout out to the donators. Lisa Chambly. Uh, that's a female, a female listener of Let There Be Talk. Holy shit. Can't even believe it. And she donated to the podcast. Thank you, Lisa. Awesome. And Wade Skull. Great name. Wade Skull. <laughs> That's a great name, dude. Wade Skull. If you got pulled over by the cops, they'd think it was fake when you go, oh, I don't have my ID, man. What's your name? Wade Skull. <laughs> Wade Skull donated, too. Thank you so much. Uh, I got a great guest today. Great guest. And uh, you know how I love to feature the drummers on my show. Um, yes, it's happening again. I've got Tony Hajar on today. And he is the drummer of At The Drive-In, which is one of the most outlaw rock bands going. Tony has been... Uh, I've been trying to get him on the show now for... Um, Fuck, oh, a couple years, and it finally happened. And man, what a deluxe episode. He stopped by and talked all things uh, at the drive in. Of course, we talked Sparta also. And, uh, and we talk about uh, the things he does off the stage. Does some incredible, incredible things with his wife. They have this uh, awesome uh, speech therapy uh, program company. Uh, smile and I uh, hosted a benefit for them a couple years ago and they just do fantastic work we talk all kinds of great stuff on here and uh, you're gonna love this episode man I do and it's great to have another fantastic drummer on I love to feature the drummers I just think that they don't get enough glory and like I've always said you show me a great band, and I, I guarantee they have a good drummer or a great drummer. I've never seen a fantastic band and went, this band's great. How did they do it with this shit drummer? <laughs> That's something you've never heard. So great to have them on. Thank you, Tony, for doing the show. One last thing before I do start the episode. Uh, I want to give big, big shout out to the Cars for finally getting into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It is just absolutely, uh, you know, it, justice. Justice is done. Somebody was like, I can't believe priests, they got robbed, they didn't get in. There's no way. And I worship Judas Priest. There is no way they were getting in on the first first nod there's just no, I'm, sabbath it took eight times and and you can see that letter that uh the rock and roll hall of fame sent sent out to uh rob halford just lunacy rock and roll hall of fame and as much as we could say rock and roll hall of fame yeah it's shit and oh they're fucking stupid and everything i do i do back up a building where people can go celebrate and enjoy the um, the history of rock and roll, and uh, I, I think we do need that. Do I uh, do I think it's just this building? No, man. I think San Francisco deserves their own building. They've got that great one up there in Seattle that I've gone to. Uh, what is it? The like music experience or something? I forget what it is, but that thing's done very well. They rotate in different uh, great, great. Uh, projects in there yeah man i think a few cities should have their own you know fuck it not one rock and roll hall of fame i think there should be multiple ones you go to san fran you go hey where's the uh music museum here for the hippie scene the metal scene the uh you know the all that music that rich golden era of music in san francisco and how about in detroit making one big one there. Of course, they've got some cool things to see there, like the uh, Motown and, and that stuff. But, you know, uh, the cars. Thank God they're in there. And Judas Priest, I'm sure, will be in one day. Bon Jovi got in. 
And I believe Bon Jovi should be in just for the one song, I'll Be There For You, because it is a smoking, smoking song in my mind. Anyway, congratulations to Cars, and I uh, hope you guys are all doing great, and I hope you have a fantastic uh, holiday. Happy Hanukkah to anyone that celebrates Hanukkah out there. That's happening right now, and... Uh, what else we got going on? It's going to be a 2018 any minute. So I hope you guys uh, get your, uh, your, your resolutions together and ready to ditch those after a week of 18. And uh, fuck all you that go to the gym for the first couple of weeks and fuck up the gym and then give up. <laughs> yeah, man, stay out of the gym. Walk around the block a couple times. See if you like that before you join a gym. Walk around the block all of January. Get home from work. Walk around the block every day in January and then go, yeah, I'm going to do this and then join a gym. <laughs> I love all you guys. Come see me at the uh, La Jolla Comedy Store in January. I'll be headlining out there on January 12th, 13th, and 14th. Also, a new show just came in. Uh, let's see. Santa Barbara with Bill Burr. I'll be there February 15th. That's the, uh, the makeup show from last month. And then uh, March 8, 9, and 10, I'll be uh, Buffalo at Helium. Check that out. And that's all I've got right now. I love you guys. Keep the candles lit. Keep everything uh, positive. Oh, and leave a review. I'm at, uh, how many reviews am I at right now? I'm just curious because I'm almost at 1,000. Let's see here. I want to check it real quick because uh, I just want to get to 1,000. Right? You know, fucking, let's do that. Leave a review and subscribe to this podcast. That's how we keep it in the top 100. Hasn't been in the top 100 in a long time. Not enough subscribers. I don't know how I have all these listeners and not everyone subscribing. Yeah, that's me complaining. <laughs> okay, 954 uh, reviews right now. Let's get that thing to 1,000. Keep the candles lit. Let's rock it. Here we go. All right, here we are, another episode of Let There Be Talk. Fantastic guest today. Introduce yourself, my man. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Tony Hajar uh, from At The Drive-In and some other, other little things. <laughs> drum drum god. Yeah. Drum master, fresh home from tour. How long were you guys out, man? A long time. Right? Well, this time, I mean, we started touring in March yeah. and, uh, of this year and off and on until two weeks ago. Jeez. So... You know, the record came out in May. We we did we made up some shows in March that we had to cancel in 2016, and uh, and then those ended up being kind of cool warm up shows for the record. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah, the record came out in May, and and then we just uh, released uh, last in record store week day, which was now what two weeks ago. Yep. We released uh, a new EP. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that had three new songs that we recorded in Hamburg in August. What, so you guys had some time off in in Hamburg, and you just recorded? No, it's it's just the way we always work. We had a day off in Chicago the the tour before, and we just went into a studio and wrote three tracks. Wow! And uh, and then we we did that, and then we you know kept on digging into them during during the road, and then we decided uh, Omar's good friends uh, with the owner of Clouds Hill Studio in Hamburg. Right. This like. I mean, you don't think it's going to be cool. You walk into this industrial area in Hamburg and you walk in. It's an amazing studio. Like one one room has a Neve. The other room has an API. Wow. The floor above you, that's where the band stays. Wow. And so we lived there for about just three days. I mean, but it's like the kind of place you're like, I want to do a full record here. Oh, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, so we did three songs there. And, you know. There's something magical feel- about Hamburg, too. Yeah. You think, uh, I mean, you know, back to the early Beatles for you sure. know, and yeah. also that was such a uh, Hamburg is to me is like a, a rock and roll weird kind of uh, underground city. Oh know? yeah, and it's just you know it, 
it feels rock and roll. It doesn't matter where you are in Hamburg. It feels rock and roll. Yeah, I mean, it, it, Hamburg. And then you got Berlin where Bowie did of all course. that stuff. And, yeah. and I think you too, Octung Baby, all that. There's so, something yeah. about Germany, you know? Yeah. Uh, there's stuff out of there too, man, except... You know, scorpions, scorpions, right? Yeah. I mean, you can laugh at scorpions. All, all the amazing crowd rock, you know, it's just yeah, like, oh, yeah. God, yeah. yeah, all yeah. that stuff, man. So Hamburg, uh, and then you guys just went in there and busted it out. Yeah, huh? I just busted it out in three days. Wow. Three songs. We were doing, you know, 14-hour days and uh, That's just had best, a blast. Right? And it was right in the middle of a tour. Like, yeah. it, was, it was a really fun tour for us because it's the way we like to work. We, we did festivals. We recorded an EP. We did some solo shows. We did we did a you know all this insane stuff, and then we did a BBC session. So wow. all that was one tour in August, and it yeah. was like that's the way you want to tour, keeping yeah. it interesting. You know, you want to you if you're going to go out, you want to be working. Yeah, you, you want know? the sit ar- the sit around in your hotel time, brutal. as you know, is the brutal time. Yep, and and so for for us, it just like let, let's just let's just do everything we can, and you go home, and then you chill out. Was this like the first tour? Do you feel uh, that you guys, I, I don't know, because there was that one tour a few years ago. I think it was, a, what year was that? Uh, with like um, uh, Coachella and stuff like that. Oh, that, that. was 2012. Yeah. So yeah, 10 that shows. That kind of felt like a kind of a funky tour, forced tour. I had talked to uh, Omar about it. He was going through some uh, strange yeah. times in his life. But this one, do you guys feel like, man, it was just great times. Everybody's uh, out there. Yeah, I mean, the the it's it's the whole 2012 thing was. It started in 2011, November 2011. We got into a studio in El Paso and we jammed. Yeah, and everything felt right. Everyone was in good spirits. Omar was planning to move back to El Paso to be with his mom. And, you know, it was, there was some little rough times and we were kind of feeling each other out, but we decided, let's just do 10 shows. And that's it. Right. Nothing more. Let's book 10. Let's play 10. And then as we were flying in to do rehearsals, Omar's mom passes away. Oh, yeah. And, and, and it's like, you know, and we all, we've all lost people we love. And it's just, you know, I, I know the feeling. I've lost both my parents. And it was, it was, uh, it was hard on everybody. And it was, I mean, my poor brother, like he was having a really rough time at it and we were just trying to be there for him. And to be honest with you, most people would have just canceled. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you absolutely. Know, we got a lot of flack for that and how Omar was on acting on stage and stuff like that. But you know what? I'm sorry. We, oh, so yeah. we played the shows and if yeah. you, if you didn't like those shows, you know, like, sorry. Yeah. You know? I mean, people forget that, um, we are human. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they just think you're, I mean, to a point there is a, a thing where if you're sick, um, or if you're going through some dark times, there is a point where you can step on stage and stuff does go away magically for a little bit. Yeah. But as time goes, uh, it, it starts to catch you. And then you're like, oh, I'm fucked now because here I am up here doing art, but I'm thinking about something else. And exactly. then your mind starts to just, you know, frazzle. And people forget that you're human, man. Like, you know, you got to think when you go to your job, wherever you work, if your parents passed away, your mom or dad, you would be fucked, you know, at Yeah, work. you go home for a week. Yeah, you're like, oh, I got to go to work. <laughs> yeah, and, you yeah. know, fucking jack in a box. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like that. But yeah, so I think a lot of people do forget that, and um, and I always think about it. Uh, also, I look at it as uh, I look at it as interesting. Like, oh, I saw the uh, tour where his mom passed away. That was bizarre. It's like when you look at Zeppelin, you know, mm. and you think about all the different eras of Zeppelin. You're like, oh, well, Jimmy had a broke finger there. Yeah. Robert Plant's son passed away. Uh, Plant was in a crash. You know, all this stuff, yeah. and they're still out there working. You know, you're like, wow, that's fucking brutal. No, you know? absolutely. You know, that was you know a for you know people some people called it a false step but for us it was you know what it it was the beginning of us again We're, regardless how you think about it yeah it wasn't the best of times right but it was a step forward yeah and then you know um again and a, a time that a lot of people have never actually heard of and we've rarely ever spoken about it if ever 
we got to, we started we got together again in February of 2014. Wow! And that's when like around the anti mask thing, like is that, right before right because um, that's what kicked off anti mask, right? It's exactly. Like, oh, fuck it, this ain't gonna happen. Yeah, the thing is, we you know we got together and. Paul and I were determined to get Omar and Cedric to speak again. Yeah. And uh, we decided, you know, a safe place is always a studio. Yeah. So everyone flew into LA, obviously where I live. So it was easier for me. Um, and, you know, and those are the times that, you know, we, we were, you know, Jim never showed up to those. Not once. We, we had a week and then we, ha- we had a week of, of writing, jamming, talking, mostly talking. And then we had two weeks off and we planned another week. And then Jim never showed up to any of those rehearsals and uh, that's when we all decided like that's when we were like you know if it's not us five it's just not going to work out right and that's and we just we packed it up again and the same thing happened when you started to do this uh, yes. like the gym battles went yeah down yeah again. we we uh, october of 2015 you know it's hard for me to talk to, about because you know i played with jim you know the, the the joke was i was the last guy to ever you know play with jim after at the drive-in the first time around 2001 because we we clashed a lot right and uh and i'm the one if you do all the math i'm probably the one that's played with him the longest you know but you know we had some great years and you know he just he refused to put the past in the past you know it's one of those things in any relationship if you and i are friends forever you're gonna do stuff that's gonna piss me off and i'm gonna do stuff that pisses you off but the end are you gonna shake hands and forget yep or are you only gonna remember what someone did to you well you you know you know um as as we get older, I'm 51, but you really start to look at things like, man, like you carry this shit with you, and it, it creates negative energy all around your life. Absolutely. You know, you might not even know, but you might have troubled relationships with your, your lady, yeah. or you, if you have kids, or, or anything, because of maybe one bad relationship that you can fix, and and after a while, butting heads just like... You know, it just gets weird. You know, I mean, if Omar and Cedric can get back together yeah, after all that, after all that, yeah. you you you're telling me that Jim can't. Do, you know, yeah. it's 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 uh, and it's the hardest fucking thing ever to be in a band. That's why I'm so glad I'm a comedian now because my work ethic and my drive is there's something in my brain that ticks of got to keep doing this yep. and maybe. And I'm just saying, maybe I have no idea who Jim is or anything. I mean, I know who he is, but I don't know, I know him as saying. a person. Yeah. But maybe he doesn't want to do it anymore. Exactly. That's and, that's the best way of putting it. In the end, it's when the people that were giving us a hard time about it, you know, they don't understand what we went through from October of 2015 when we sat down in a hotel in El Paso, Texas. And you know, Setter called me uh, like three weeks before that and Cedric goes, what is it going to take for you to do this band again? I know when does a singer call a drummer and ask him that? Right. That's my joke. Right. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, usually they're like, we'll just get another guy. Yeah, let's just get another you drummer. That guy doesn't matter. There's all these uh, okay. new kids on YouTube. We can get them for 40 bucks. Yeah, they've never played a show, but yeah. you know what? They're going to be great. Yeah, and the fans won't even notice. <laughs> He's just a one. fucking the drummer. The fans won't, won't even notice. notice. Yeah. Whenever my favorite bands tra- change drummers, I'm like, are you kidding me on the feel on this? I mean, I could list them. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, you know, Cedric and I had a great talk, uh, in September of 2015 and, you know, I, I, you know, I put down the phone. I, I obviously I, I told, I told my wife about everything and she goes, you know, you guys, the love that you guys have for each other is unmeasurable. Yeah. And so she literally told me, stop emailing each other stop texting. And why don't you guys go to El Paso and just meet? And I was like, oh, Okay. You know, it almost didn't hit me because I was just like, I was, we were already starting the static, you know, static when emails, when people don't understand each other, you yeah. know, get the point. You can't and get the tone. Yeah, you can't get a tone. There's no tone, man. It, yeah, it was already starting. And so, you know, we all flew to El Paso. We had a three hour meeting straight and then we stopped. We took a break. We met again. It was a lot of back and forth. And, and then in the end, we said, we decided let's have one more talk in when we're all home. That talk, we thought was was good so we you know i started doing what i do in the band which is take meetings with agents and management yeah. and like start creating a team are you that guy i'm i i was the guy i was that guy a long time ago in the band and the i business was business guy yeah band, i was huh? always i was always you know i've calmed down i was kind of over the top business guy 
And, um, you know, the joke was I, you know, I used to force the guys to do things they never wanted to do. Mini micromans, yeah, like yeah. that kind of shit. Yeah, I was that guy. I was dad, wow. but not in the best way. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, but now like, you know, like, you know, Omar and I met up and we said, okay, let's just, let's do these meetings. You know, Omar in the Mars Volta years, that's he, you know, he's, that be his, my position became his in Volta, you know, right. and, and so we had this like amazing energy of let's do it together. Let's get back. Let's get find agents. Let's get, let's book a tour. And then, you know, we were getting, we were booking all that stuff. And then the benefit that you think, right. thank you very much. MC, MC so, for it was one, it was, it was incredible to be asked to, to MC that, you know, thank you very that much. Thing. I mean, there I am, uh, MC and this great benefit, but also at the drive in. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. like, oh, I get to sit on stage and feel this fucking electricity <laughs> two feet away. Yeah, you know? I mean, it's, it, and you know, we had all this stuff planned, and then literally a week and a half before, we were like, oh my God, it's going to fall apart again. Because oh, oh, of Jim. Yeah, yeah. And it was just like, no, nothing was working. It was just like, frustration and talks and none of the talks were flowing and we're like here we are in 2014 again yeah and like we can't keep doing this to our fans and to ourselves what is the what is the battle between all of you because now that i have you here it's interesting to think uh i thought it was just cedric and omar but then as you really unfold it it was everybody had their own problems right and own problems and own roles and it's a it's a band that that worked there was no true leader and still isn't this, right. this band is like you know the our, our gentle giant paul you think like he he plays bass yeah no he doesn't he plays bass and he sits with me for hours and we go through excel sheets and budgets wow and he, he goes through he he's all over the tour managers making sure that we're happy on the road this is we could save money here we could spend money here and stuff that you'll never see and people most people don't care about wow. you know what i mean and so like everyone has their role yeah you know and that's good too yeah, because yeah. you're it not keeps it healthy it's not a bunch of rock dummies too yeah, like yeah. i don't know what happened we were out on tour <laughs> just, we we're having a great time we came over with no money people are, you know these, yeah yeah these rock we've heard the stories you know yeah and, and, and there's always that kind of guy in the band you know they just cruise along for years they don't give a fuck about anything and then one day they go hey man and they're like, yeah. hey, dude, I've been telling you for like six years, you shouldn't be doing this. You yeah. shouldn't be doing that. And you're like, fuck you, you dad. And then all of a sudden they have no money. Yeah. And, and then the friction starts coming. They're like, you know, you guys got houses and shit. It's like, no, you could have had a house too, but you decided right not to. You flew yeah. private one time. That was 20 grand. Then here you had room service every night, $140. Yeah. You called your girlfriend from Germany on the fucking hotel phone. Yeah, these, you know what I mean? It's like, no, no, I, I get it. And yeah. you know that the thing is like we we've grown to be a band that we respect what each other do and we don't have to like climb all, all over each other to check on each other. Right. You know, we know Omar produces and is, is that's his thing. We know that Cedric is art is, is his thing and guiding the art of the and the feel and the aesthetic of the band. You know, I'm the one that takes those the, the business meetings and I, I deal with that stuff and I hire and fire, you know, like, uh, that's and, rad. and then, and Paul deals with the production side of things and make sure everything's ready and set. And, and then now Keely, you know, he's an amazing post guy and graphics guy. And, you know, so he literally guides that train and, and we finish a lot of stuff in house because of Keely. Wow. You know, so it's like, so we, we have our bases covered in this band and, yeah. And we didn't think that was going to happen again because we here we are we changed members, but I, we changed members almost scientifically. You know, when I was asked by Omar and Paul, like, "What is your thought of who we should get?" Literally at the last minute. Yeah, it was I mean, the last minute. It, like sweating bullets. Here. Absolutely, and There's I was like, benefit. There, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah there, I was like, "There's no one else to get but Keely." Keely saved Sparta for me. Yeah, Keely came in when Paul was going through a rough time and he, he had to leave Sparta and Keely saved the band with his positivity and his greatness and his just positive, amazing, wonderful soul. And I said, guys, we don't need another pain in the fucking ass. Like, I'm not calling Jim that. I'm just saying right. we don't need another big personality. It's got to be a smooth Yeah, a piece. smooth press and a guy that doesn't have to step over you so you could pay attention to him. Right. And I knew Keely was the guy, even though the only person that had ever met him before, besides me, obviously, was Paul. Because wow. Sparta took his old band, Engine, down on tour wow. years ago. So he comes in, like literally knowing no one, 
And we, just, I literally just emailed them all the songs he's got to play. Wow. And I was like, and I was like, well, and then I was like, I don't have that download. So buy the record, <laughs> and, you, know, <laughs> you, know, like, you know, so like, and he just came in and we had, we had like, I think it was six days before we saw you wow. and he just came in and just killed it. I backups, crushed it. Backups, everything like just and killed vibe. it. Yeah. And, vi- and vibe. Yeah. Vibe too, because you know, usually a guy like that's just deer in the headlights. Like, Oh yeah. fuck, what song's next? <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. But wow. And did you guys, re- how many rehearsals with them? I think it was six. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, and so, you know, he saved the day and you know, he's our, he's still our positive light. He's a positive guy. He's, he's, He's low maintenance. Yeah. Uh, the rest of us are high maintenance yeah. in our own ways. Yeah, yeah. So it's just like he's the perfect, he's perfect for us in that respect. And now we've gotten to do two records with him. He fits. There's yeah. nothing, there's nothing weird. There's not, you know, it's like he there's stuff he's still learning about our personalities, which you know, we okay. have we yeah, have yeah. 20 years of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. when we weren't talking, yeah, we still like, felt each other. You guys don't seem to be talking to me. It's like, oh, right now we don't talk. We're yeah, four, four we months in. Yeah, you, yeah, we don't talk right now. Oh, I yeah. forgot you haven't been around, but yeah, right yeah. now we're just like, hey, get away from me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So like he's fit the vibe, and now here we are um over a year and a half after the the smile benefit. Right. And we've now we recorded and and released um 16 songs since then. Any words so, from Jim? No. No. And he doesn't play, right? No, he uh he just uh re uh, re uh, restarted Sparta without me. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I was like I was like whatever. And uh they're um they're they're doing just one show in El Paso that I know of and Yeah. You know what? Like I want people to be happy, you know what exactly. I mean? Exactly. You know what I mean? Like I don't like we're too old for this shit. I always, you know, that that's the main comment that everyone says over and over when, when we get old, when people get older. Yeah, yeah. And it's like we're too old for this shit. Yeah. We're not dying and we're not homeless and we have a fucking roof over our head and goddamn it. And we're go alive. play a show. I'm happy. I hope you're happy. Yeah. And I hope you're healthy and I hope your family's healthy. And that's all that matters. Right? Exactly, man. Yeah. And, and, and I think pe- some people will never know that until they're like uh as cheesy as this is, I got diabetes a couple of years ago. It's gone yeah. now, but it, that's only a small thing. It's big. It's a health problem yes, is, big yeah. time, and it could be scary. But at the time, it was very scary, and I was like, oh, nothing matters. You realize right away when your health, like, like if you get cancer or whatever, you're like, what? why was I battling this stupid shit? It's yeah. like David Cassidy just passed away, and his last words were too much wasted time. You know? And I hear that and I was like, wow, yeah. it's so true. How much time do we all waste in arguments and weirdness? And, and shit just yeah. flies by, you yeah. know, like all of a sudden you're like, oh man, I'm old and I, I, I spent my life battling, yeah. you know? It's it's incredible that you guys, uh, you put out a great record. Thank you. And it's incredible that you guys uh, uh, seem to be just, you know, kicking ass now. Uh, and we're having the time of our lives. We're, we're that's getting, amazing. We're getting along. I mean, you've been backstage through it all. You know, every it's awesome. every LA show. I mean, you see the vibe, and we're we're always together. We yeah. on days off, we're together. It's on days so on, we're together. Like we we just sit in the dressing room together, even when we have multiple dressing rooms, and all we do is make each other laugh. Yeah, and it feels that's what a band should it, be. It feels like 1998. You yeah. know, like it it really does. That's that's our vibe right now, and you know, I'm, we're very thankful. What you know, how old are you now? I'm 43. 43. I watch you play and I think about like, it, it's no joke to be in this band because <laughs> you guys have fuck, fucked yourself and backed yourself into this corner of like really <laughs> radical live. Yeah. I still say it to this day. Uh, the most violent performance I ever saw was Letterman. Uh, <laughs> you know, when you guys played Letterman, yeah. it, it's still just like, what the fuck, you know? Um, what is like? What's it like on your body now? You're out there for a, a long run this time. Yeah. Uh, are you falling apart, or do you, <laughs> do you get better? Like I'm, I'm feeling better. Well, the the thing is, like, um, I was I was you know pretty fine. I keep in shape. I I exercise a lot. I run a lot, um, and I eat well and all that stuff. I think I always have, luckily. Um, but you know, I've had. I've had shoulder problems that, you know, a lot of drummers have in their right shoulder. Right. And all I really did is adjust a few things on my drums and now I'm feeling great. And I'm doing that and acupuncture. Yeah. And it's 
and it's really dissipating you know it's yeah it's it's brutality i i don't you know sometimes i go i watch a band and i go and i i'm of course i'm i'm always watching the drummer and cuz i love to learn from everyone and and i and some guys are just you know they hit really soft yeah. because they've got a massive PA in front of them and they should be hitting soft because they're saving their body. They're the smart ones. Yeah. And then I go up there, I was making, I was, Cedric and I were laughing. I'm like, why do I go up there and just like destroy everything every night? Adrenaline, and right? And, and I destroy my body and then, and, and I'm like, it's still the same the same volume on the in front of the PA. Yeah, it wasn't like the drummer's <laughs> loud as fuck. And, yeah. and he goes, it's because, and Cedric made the joke, he goes, because it's because when we were touring in 1996, and you would set up your kick drum first, like literally in front of the crowd when we were just set up right in front of the crowd, and you would hit your bass drum, and everyone would go, ah! and yeah. then and then I'm like, and I'm like, what, what do you mean by that? He goes, because just the way you used to hit your kick drum back then, people were like, they thought you were on a PA, yeah, and and, and I and and he goes, but now you have a PA, Tony, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, and, and and the thing is like, and I'm like, yeah, you're right. So you know, it's there, it's it's just one of those things. I can't I can't go to like a calm state well I, it's, it's, it's the it, music it's, too. It's, but it's yeah. also in my head to this day after all these years i still think people like don't like us and i've got to prove it to them <laughs> it's hilarious to this day, like, I, I go up any show it doesn't matter for headlining you're looking out in the crowd <laughs> that guy's arms are crossed <laughs> check out this well, bah, bah. <laughs> well now it's like they're texting in the first row oh yeah um, but <laughs> assholes right yeah. but like but yeah i i I think we all in this band, for some reason, and only in this band, and the chemistry in this band, we always feel we have something to prove. Yeah. I have no idea why. That's hilarious. Yeah. It's funny that you said you just made some adjustments on your drums because uh, Dave Lombardo is a good friend of mine. He's done the show many times. And it's funny because he goes- Tell him I'm the biggest fan. I just haven't had it. I've, I haven't had the balls to go and introduce myself the few times I've been around. Oh, you got it, yeah. dude. He's so fucking I'm nice. I'm such a huge fan. He's- He's one absolutely, of the reasons I play. He's absolutely the best. Yeah. Absolutely the best. And one of the reasons I don't really go see Slayer anymore, no knock to Slayer or of whatever. Course, yeah. But to me, it's it, it's all about groove when it comes to drums. And he could play speed metal with, with a groove, groove. Yeah. Which is almost impossible. Yeah. You know, but he told me. He goes, you know, these guys, they swing their arms way up in the fucking air and they're going to have shoulder problems later. And then they got the bass drum, the, uh, the toms all wide. And now they're reaching over here like they're flying an airplane. You know, he goes, it's right here. It's just surgical. It's like, yeah. it's like, it's like chopsticks. He's, you know, and that's how his body stays kick ass, you know? Yeah. I mean, the thing is, you know, he... I remember when I was a kid and I and I heard, you know, I had heard all the records, but yeah. the record that literally like changed my life at 15 was South of Heaven. It's unbelievable. And every song on that record, I'm just all, okay, it's it, the best freaking record ever, you know? And uh, and I saw him at Riot uh, this past, when was Riot Fest? June, I think? Yeah, right. Uh, and uh, I don't even remember when it was. Um, and uh, and I, just, I was just watching him from the side of the stage going, I'm watching Dave Lombardo. I'm good. I'm, I was the happiest guy on earth, but you know, Omar was like, well, how come you didn't go introduce yourself? Like, he's like, you know, I'll, you know, cause Omar's good friends with Patton. Right. And, uh, I was just like, I don't know. I'm just going to sit back here and not introduce myself to one of my favorite drummers ever. Um, that, that project he's doing with Mike Patton yeah. right now is absolute fire. Yeah. It's, it's it, insane. It's so crazy because it's, um, it's just like, it's punk rock. Yeah. You know, it's pretty, pretty intense. Tense, man. Yeah. Uh, Lombardo's an, crazy, an incredible guy. Who else were your guys growing up back in the day playing drums, you know? Because um, you, you have a, a unique style. Like, who were your guys? Well, I mean, I was, you know, it, it's, you know, I, I'll lose cool punk points, but uh, <laughs> when I was a kid, like, I wasn't a punk guy. I didn't know anything about punk whatsoever. Yeah. I was a metal guy. Yeah, me you too. Know, I grew up on... First, like my brother showing me ACDC and Zeppelin, uh, to like me trying to find myself, and then I, you know, I obviously like everyone else in the world found Metallica. Right. You know, when you post the stuff from Day in the Green and all that stuff, and oh. it just it still gives me chills. You know, me Cliff, too. You know, Cliff them all gives me chills. You know, and so I was that guy, and so like 
you know, when I heard Ride the Lightning and then Master of Puppets, Ra- Master of Puppets to me still is the most iconic metal record ever. It's unbelievable. And, and, and the thing is like, and then I was like, oh my God, I love, I love Metallica, I love Lars. But then what got me super excited about Lars is that he was the business guy. Yeah. And so there was something about me as even as a little kid when I was barely learning drums, I wanted that role. Yeah. It was a weird thing. And so like, I, that's, you know, it was those, the big four. Yeah. It was the big four. And I went to, I got to go to the big four, which I was really excited about. Um, How about Bonded by Blood? Oh, yeah. Come bonded on. by Blood is incredible. I think yeah. Bonded by Blood is, uh, you know, to me, it's, it's like Masters and, and Ride the Lightning, I think are the greatest of all time. But Bonded by Blood is right. It, to me, it's, oh, it's amazing. It's, it's a, you know the twins on the cover yeah. of Bonded by Blood? Yeah. I feel that's Metallica and Exodus. Wow. Because there's this kind of intertwining of that sound and that right hand of... Yeah, yeah. And, the, and, and obviously uh, the, the, the connection with Kirk and all course. that. Of course. Yeah, yeah. But I truly believe they're kind of the same animal at that era. Of thrash at, metal, yeah. At, yeah, at that yeah. era, it's really the sound of to me of thrash metal is that galloping right hand and the, the, the rolls... Yeah, yeah. You yeah, yeah. know, that's darkness of it too. But yeah. yeah, man. I mean, I mean those those were my those were my guys, and then then I got into like you know death metal. Like, oh yeah, I went that way. I went like uh, merciful fate or yeah. darker. No dark. Like yeah. I was I was you know deicide and oh, obituary yeah. and pestilence and yeah. and all those bands, and then you know and then you know then I got away from metal completely, and I was playing this in this like you know when the word alternative came out, I was right. playing one of those bands. And then in 1996, I joined this my first punk band in El Paso, Texas, called Two Edge, and they had they had this drummer for many many years, and just a, an amazing soul and a great friend, um, and it just didn't work out. And the band reformed kind of around me, and I started playing in that band. And the guitar player there is like, you know, you want to tour, you you're ready to drop out of college, you're the only one going to college, like, and this band's never going to go anywhere. We need to figure. Like we need to get into at the drive-in, and I said, I don't really, I don't really get into at the drive-in. You know, like yeah. we're all local bands, you know, right, right. And uh, and then and he goes, but we could, you know, we could help, like you know, make the sound go in a certain way. And at that point, all the local bands were just kind of like not just. I think they just wanted to be local. So there's only a few of us were like ready to give it all up, right. And I remember I was um I was a chemistry major in in, in college. Wow. And I was literally where were do- you going? In, to UTEP. Oh wow. In El Paso. And I was doing a, a f- I was literally doing a reaction in the lab with a lab coat. And I get a knock on the door, and it's Omar and Cedric. And I put all my stuff down and take off my goggles. Yeah. And uh, they come to the school. <laughs> they snuck into the university. Hilarious. <laughs> and then they're all, "What's up?" And I'm like, "Hey guys, what are you guys doing here?" And yeah, like, yeah. You know, and they're like. We got you know. Let's jam. Let's do it. And and so that they just come to the college. I love that story. And I right that at that point that was a a, the the beginning of of January in 1996. And um, at that point, a few days later on January 10th, I remember the date. I dropped out of college. I lost my job because I worked at the college, and I lost the place I lived all in one day. Wow. And I said, and I was like about to get this job, this high paying job, and. In the water department in El Paso, I was like a top chemist in in, in my in the field there and in, in in at UTEP, and I just literally just left everything because I just felt the energy from these guys. That's amazing. And then I I went to where Omar and Cedric, Cedric were uh, like kind of almost you know um, living but not living. It was just this weird situation where a friend of ours lived, and I just sat down with them and I just said, "Okay, guys, I've literally given up everything." I have. Yeah. So let's, we're going to fucking do this, right? And everyone was all, yes. And then I, Cedric hands me a mixtape. And on that mixtape is Fugazi and Hoover and Indian Summer and all where, you know, the word emo came up from and yeah. Rites of Spring. And I remember I, I got that mixtape and I put it in my tape machine and Fugazi came out. And believe it or not, the first time I ever heard Fugazi, and I'm, I'm going to lose more punk points here, is 1996. <laughs> wow. And, you know, there were like, I don't know how many records in at that point. Yeah, yeah, right. You know, and, and I was like, oh, yeah, I could do this. Yeah. You know, just like, because the power of Fugazi. Were they kind of handing you the roadmap of this is what we want to do? Yeah, because, 
you know, they knew where I came from and I didn't hide it. Like yeah. I love where I came from. Yeah. You know, but they they want, you know, as we all know in metal, drumming's about tightness and not and big hits and absolutely and, and emo. Especially once you get into that helmet era. Yeah, yeah. Where it's all precise. Yeah. <laughs> and that was me. Like yeah. I, I grew up like practicing double bass on my wall in my in my house, you yeah. know. I was, you know, I was that guy. I played double bass in the whole nine yards. And so they wanted a drummer that like was more tight and they wanted to bring that feel because that feel wasn't really there except with Fugazi and except with Hoover yeah. and uh, a few other discord bands. But all the feel back then was very loosey and slow and very yeah, depressing. Yeah. And they wanted to bring that sound. And I was like, well, that I can do because I can't do what acrobatic tenement had yeah um because we were to gonna tour on that i was like can we just play the songs more like i can't do that loose can we just play them tighter and they're like yes and and it was just and then that on that second i knew i'm in this band yeah for keeps that's you amazing know? man yeah you remember uh recording relationship of course R ross and yeah. i mean ross is a old friend of mine maybe 25 years now oh, shit. which is fucking crazy as 25 i said yeah. years yeah he um i remember when that record came out you guys played uh uh you played at the great american music hall yeah in san francisco i remember and i was like what the fuck i mean that record is so monumental i mean it really is this masterpiece uh, it, that probably has allowed you guys to work forever. You yeah, know what I maybe. Mean? Yeah, yeah. It's so gr it's so great. But when you're recording that, I've I've been with Ross when he records drummers, and he's pretty hard on them and crazy. What was the process of doing that record? Were you just like, what the fuck is going on? Or was it pretty easy? No, I, it was it was the it was probably one of the worst situations I've ever been into. You know, I like. I'm not the biggest fan of Ross, right. and you know, I know your friends, so excuse me, but no, no, you know, but, uh, but it, you know, like, it doesn't matter yeah. because I understand when art butts heads with yeah. Producers well, the, and the, stuff. the thing is, like we, you know, it it was a very weird situation for me because we had just finished, we were we started that record and we're flying through it. There yeah. was just this fire, fire in the room, and we had just in in two days we had done three songs on drums and bass done. On tape, everyone was just like, "We got this." Yeah. Um, and this is this is Ross's story to share beyond this, but I think something personally was happening to him on day three. Right. And all of a sudden, we were starting the whole record over. Wow. And all of a sudden, my life became hell because I think there was some hell going on in his life. So he decided to point it at you. Yeah. And and at first, I took it. I took it. I took it. And then the band started seeing me fracture. Yeah. And they knew me as the guy that someone picked on. I don't ask questions. I just attack you with a bottle. Yeah. That, that was me. Yeah. I was this 145-pound bodyguard to my buddies. Yeah. You know? And they saw me literally go the other way because you know what? I wasn't going to fuck up our first major label record in the back of my head. Right. Um, are you are you talking to the guys at night? Like what the no, fuck's going on? No, I'm not talking to anybody at and this point. Are they tripping? Like they're wait, tripping. We got three in the can. Yeah. Why are we starting they're, over? You know, everyone's tripping. Everyone's right. going. What's going on? What happened? And I'm the first person to step up and say, the producer that we picked yeah. is saying this. So let's just let's just do it. And then slowly it becomes this like mind game. And you know, he, I'm recording one of the easiest parts on the record on quarantined and he's got dave mclean uh the drummer of sacred reich and now machine head right on the other side of the glass one of my idols he dave mclean doesn't know that right um wa watching me and while i'm recording they're literally laughing on the other side of the window and when you're recording and you're that oh yeah like alone you don't know if they're laughing at you or not laughing with you so it just became this fucking game and then it starts fucking with your mind yeah then you're yeah going, is my meter bad am yeah, i playing what am, something and then weird? it just then and yeah. then it just literally fucks with my whole psyche until one of the assistant engineers who is still a f great friend of mine to this day takes me into one of the iso booths in the in the studio unplugs all the mics he's freaking out yeah and i'm like what's wrong what's wrong and he says ross is trying to get rid of you He's having these conversations with the engineer and us when the band isn't in the room. 
and he's doing it slowly with everyone separately in the band when you when they are alone and you're not in the room. Wow. Wow. And and so my band, thank goodness for my band, they kept it uh you know, they just they refused to buy into the the glam of Ross wanting to have models in the studio while you're recording because you record better when models are around and all the bullshit right. that comes uh, when you're, you've done too many big records. And, and so literally it, it got to the point that Jim finally walked into the studio one day. I had finished drums, almost finished drums. And, and Jim literally says to everyone in the room, if I hear one more comment or inkling of a comment about drummers, a note of Tony's drumming or anything, I don't care who you are, we are firing you. Wow. And he looks at Ross. He looks at Chuck, the engineer, and the two assistant engineers. And, and it, was, it, it got to that point. And I finally, I was living in Long Beach at the point, so are Omar and Cedric. I go back to my then girlfriend, now wife. And, and I don't want to go to the studio. I don't want to go back to the studio. Right. And Cedric's calling me one day five times, Cedric, 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 Cedric. And, and I finally answered the phone. I was like, what's up, man? And he goes, dude, Iggy Pop's coming today. Please come up Whoa. and share this with us. And I go, no, I'm good. I'm good. And oh. I'm that's literally the opposite of me. You yeah, know? yeah. And and he's like, dude, Iggy Pop's gonna be here. Like yeah. he's recording on a song. We all have to be here together. Who would have thought we would have had Iggy Pop on a record? You know? Yeah, yeah, right. And I go, and then finally, he I, he Cedric kept on calling me. Thank God for him. And he and I, I drove back to the studio from Long Beach, and I watched Iggy record, and and I was like. That's what I'm doing it for. The next day, I'm, I spend the night at the studio. Uh, Cedric's recording a uh, vocal. Cedric's tired. Yeah. The record that was supposed to take a month, we're on month almost two and a half. Wow. Uh, you know, I'm going in fast forward, obviously. Oh, yeah, of course. And, uh, and uh, you know, I'm fil- we filmed everything back, in, back then. And, and I'm filming Cedric recording vocal, and Ross is doing his thing. Um. And what is this about? And what do you feel? And literally, I'm, re- I'm, literally, I'm the guy recording it. So I'm literally witnessing it in front of me and video- videotaping it. And Cedric looks at him and goes, Ross, I'm not feeling anything. I want to finish this vocal and finish this fucking record. Yeah. And then literally, that's when I knew my band have my back. Wow. And then I never left the studio again. And then uh, time passed when we finished the record and you know prepping it for mix. You know, and, and Ross called me and, and shared with me this, some personal stuff that he was going through that happened exactly when I thought it happened. Yeah. And, uh, and he goes, and I, I took it out on you guys because I didn't want to leave the studio. Wow. And you That's could imagine what happened to my heart. Like, if I was playing with weaker souls and less of brothers. You would have been gone. I would have been gone. And at that point, I didn't want to touch a fucking drum. Yeah. And I probably, I, to be honest with you, I don't know if I ever would have played again. That's where I was. Wow. Because you, you, you start fucking with your confidence, oh, yeah. right? Like I, may, maybe I'm shitty. I'll give you the best example, Dean. I have all the confidence in the world in my playing. I know yeah. who I am. I know what I'm not good at. And I know what I'm good at. And that's all you need to know in whatever you do. And I remember I was first show back after we recorded the record. All the hype in the world is going on. It's sold that show at the Troubadour, which everyone dreams of. Of course. Of course. We're sound checking, and I, 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 I can't exaggerate enough. I couldn't play drums. What? Everyone literally was turning around, turned around to me in the band on, in front of our biggest show ever. Yeah. And they were like, are you okay? Yeah, yeah. And I couldn't play the song we were sound checking. We were sound checking Rosquashe, the first song off of Vaya. Never forget it. Oh. I couldn't play the song. What, what was the problem? You still I, had the confidence yeah, problem? I was shaking and I was like, I am going to fail my whole band. I am horrible. I'm never going to, I can't, Man, I'm going to fail my band. Fuck, just threw a, a giant fucking yeah, bummer and, into your, yeah, your, your and, psyche. And my psyche. So then, you know, I've got, I've got the the only person in the crowd that was family or friends during soundcheck was Jim's dad. And this shows you how much love I have for Jim and Jim's family. Yeah. Jim's dad, the first thing he does when we finish soundcheck, he runs the gym. And this is someone's dad. Yep. This is how much they care. And he said, what's wrong with Tony? Tony gets on the drums and it's all confidence all the time 
in your face. And that's not Tony. What's going on with him? And literally, and I, I'll never, I'll never forget this, you know, through all of Jim's and I's ups and downs. <laughs> and there was a lot of downs and a lot of ups. He took me to the, that, you know, little back room where the sink is and they put drinks in the oh, dressing yeah. room yeah, next yeah. to the bathroom. Yeah. He took me to that, closed all the doors, make sure no one came in from the sound booth. And he goes, this is where you forget all that shit. No one is around anymore. This is where we show to the world who we are. We finally have our chance. Yeah. And you're going to, you, you, you can't fail yourself. You're not going to fail us. You're going to, don't fail yourself. And literally within that talk in 10 minutes, that night I had the best show of my life. Wow. It's incredible that you guys even made such a masterpiece <laughs> when you just tell me the, the insides of that, you know? But then there's, there's stories I, I know it's their story, the story that, to share. Not just drummers that recorded with Ross, drummers that recorded with even crazier, weirder producers. Oh, I know it. Some amazing drummers that I've yeah. had stories from, but, you know, again, I'll, that's their story to, sh to share. Right. That, I've that, had, uh, you know, I've worked with producers where they're like, yeah, you're singing flat all the yeah. time. You're singing sharp all the time. And you're going like, what's going on? I, yeah. don't, I, I, I thought I did okay. Yeah. yeah, right. And then, you know. And then you work with another producer and they're like, dude, you're like one of the best singers I've ever heard. This is incredible, man. Yeah, yeah. Let's move on. You yeah, know? Yeah. You're like, what? You know? Yeah. And you don't know what is really going on with the producers, you know? Like, yeah. like you said, are they like because you can really be deflated real quick in a studio because as soon as people start soloing up stuff yeah you're like you don't hear that and you're like i don't i don't hear that what yeah, are you, yeah what are you talking about and you're in a studio too long and music's in your head the whole time and also yeah. you just come out of there like a fucking zombie yeah that's how we felt i mean the, that record the just the recording part of it you know we went from recording a record in a week or four days a yeah. full record to a three-month process not counting a mix and not counting mastery wow so man. it was so Obviously, every band records that way, but for us, it was very new. Yep. And luckily, that's the day I literally got over it. And then I was scared to record another record, to be honest with you. But, yeah. then, but at the drive-in ends right after that, Sparta forms. We get a major label deal with DreamWorks. We record with the rest in peace, Jerry Finn, and another amazing producer. And, and that guy's feet, a power and feel and the way he produced, I recorded that whole record to tape 16 songs in three and a half days. Yeah. And I was just like, there you go. I can't, you know, it's like, it literally takes these like mountains and year, uh, you know, that was a year and a half at that point to like literally, and now I just don't know. I don't let anyone fuck with me and I don't fuck with myself. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, well, you also don't know yeah. what the what the fucking um, the backstory was. Maybe there was a backstory of like we'll just get another drummer in here and yeah. uh, you'll make a little money off this major label deal. Also, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, Who knows? Who you knows? Know? Yeah, it's interesting to hear that because um, you know it's it, like I said. It, did did you and Ross? Uh, I know you're not a fan of him now, but have you put it aside? Like, ah, oh, fuck, I don't know what you're... Did you ask him, hey, man, like, I know you're going through something, but, dude, that that's not... No, good. at that point in the recording, I didn't. It was just right. that talk we did after the recording, right. and I was not... I was back into, like, you know, I'll hurt someone mode. You know, yeah, I was yeah. back to being me. Yeah, you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and I was just like, I wasn't having it. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is, I was just, you know, I was done. Again... I don't wish any harm upon anyone and I, I only wish health and happiness and right. success to Ross and everyone, you know, like, uh, but like at that point in my life, I was just like, I don't want to see you. Yeah. Wow. You know? And, uh, but you know, again, it's like years and age and all that yep. stuff, you know, you realize what not to do in your life and what to do in your life. And I, yeah. I went through a major obstacle in my playing career that I, I realized I'll never go through again. Yeah, that's you know. uh, that's that's crazy, man. You know, like uh, I've had some bad sets on comedy, and boy, it'll send you home. And I can't imagine, especially spinner. comedy. <laughs> it's really weird when it comes to like you're just you, you always know it's gonna come. I've had too many great shows in a <laughs> row, and then something comes, and you're like, "What the fuck? I don't know how to do this at all." 
And you really curl up in a ball at your house. Like, here, I live alone. And I'm just like, what happened, man? Like, nothing worked, you know? I get it. Uh, So I couldn't even imagine if I was doing comedy and there was a guy on the side of the stage going, you suck. (laughs) You're not, it's no good. Yeah. No, that joke sucks too. (laughs) And that's it. We got another comic we're going to bring in right now. So whenever you're done. He's going to be Dean Delray. Get the fuck out of yeah. here. You know what I mean? It's oh, it's so so insane, man. Wow. Yeah. That's, a, that's a crazy story to hear about that record. Yeah, man, it's, a, it's an insane story, you know. And, you know, I think a lot of records like that have have that story not they all do all the great ones yeah they, they have a weird just, something weird you never yeah. hear you never yeah, hear it was about, easy yeah we walked in we recorded in four days everybody shook hands we made out we were great friends and buddies i could and, be wrong about the history but the only record i remember hearing that about that it just every story i heard personally was just like yeah they just we just went in and recorded it and it was fine was never mind oh yeah and, and but i like every story i've heard it was just like we just went in and recorded a record yeah and i'm like that's the story you want on such a like amazing epic record, you know. Like, it was just easy. Yeah, you know? I used to watch those uh, the making of records. Yeah, oh, I like, love that stuff. Oh, right, yeah. and you know you're watching them and you're just going like, I mean, to me, most of them seemed like battles, and then at the end, that's what made the masterpiece so even better. Like now, your record to me is even crazier because <laughs> you're like, whoa! You yeah. almost di- you almost didn't play on yeah. that record, you or know? that or that could have been just my last record ever. Yeah, you know, like I, in again, which is so not my personality, but yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing that you know, it's that record. You know, after we, you know, obviously we broke up in a year and a half after that, which is insane in, in, in itself. And then when I when we got back together in 2012 and I was replaying those songs, like all these memories yeah. re-gushed. And it was so weird. I didn't have to relearn those songs. I just sat down and I just played them. Wow. And it, and it just shows you, like, after all those years, that record and the, every record we did is because we, we cut – we cut our teeth on those records. Yeah, that it, we almost laughed when we were rehearsing in 2012 because we we're like, uh, we know these. Like it's, it's, so it's like funny. no time passed That's after amazing, all these years. Right? You know, yeah. Wow. What uh, what what drums you playing now? Uh, I've played Tama since 2001. Is that because of Lombardo? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's because of Lombardo, and that's because of Lars, yeah. and uh, and to me, like. Like Tama and, you know, like there's, and, you know, I don't, I, I've only heard them. I've never actually played them. I, you know, I think Q drums are incredible. Yeah. Um, but Tama to me, like, was that drum that you could just punch it. Yeah. And you could throw it across the room and then you just pick it back up and it plays fine. You know it, what I mean? That's what's always Tama's been to me, the rock drum. You it's, know? It's funny that you uh, love Lars because I love Lars. Yeah. And uh, I've been battling people for years that say any bad shit about him. I can't stand people, you know, all the way going back to the fucking uh, Napster thing. Yeah. And now we look at it and he was right. Yeah, I mean, the Napster thing, if people actually backed Lars, we would all, musicians, be in such a different place because right after that, the, the, the movie industry, I think, learned from people like Lars and said, we need to fight as hard but 10 times harder. Right. Right, and they even though people people still pirate a film to this day, but it didn't it didn't do what it did to music. Right, it, people don't expect movies for free. Exactly, they do not expect movies yeah. for free, and yeah. that is the most mind boggling thing to me. And I've done three hundred and I don't know sixty eight episodes or whatever I'm at, uh-huh. and over and over and over it blows my mind that music is free. You yeah. Know, like, it's insane to me. It's- it really is insane. And um you know, I think that people it's so weird that they just if you just say okay, well, where do you work? And they go, I work at Starbucks. And you go, okay, at the end of the 40-hour week, you come to get your check. And I go, there's no check. Don't you know, man? You just work free. You would lose your mind, yeah. you know? And, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, it comes down to, I respect Lars more than anything from what you're talking about, the business side. The guy is a smart man. Yes. He is a smart man. He's not a rock buffoon. Not at all. And he, 
you know, and he gets more knocks than anybody. Oh, his plane sucks. Oh, he's a dick. He's greedy and all this. And it's like the guy's been in the biz 35 years. Yeah, you do what Lars did. Yeah, <laughs> you do what Lars did. Yeah. You live in another country. You play tennis. And then midway. You move to San Francisco. You move to San Francisco. <laughs> and you, you don't even know how to play drums. And you decide to, to be a, 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 in a band, you exactly. know. And, and fuck it, you know. And then. You play a style of music that's not even invented. Exactly. And, and then you fucking, you, you have four guys that aren't like foxy dudes at the time when yeah. Bon Jovi and all that shit's big. It, it's, it's just hurdle after hurdle after hurdle yeah. after hurdle. And not one, he should be raised up like king of metal right here. King of they metal. Were, they were 22 and 23 years old when they recorded Ride the Lightning. Yeah. What are people doing at 22 and 23 years old it's in music? Insane. They're on Instagram. They're on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, like they're, they're not <laughs> doing one thing. Yeah, yeah. And Those guys had been around the world. I remember when I would see them. I talked about like they were only a couple years older than me, but they seemed like 10 years older when I would see them hanging at the club because they'd been around Europe. They drank Jägermeister. <laughs> they'd seen shit. Yeah. They were like veterans from Vietnam. They yeah. come back like, dude, you don't know, man. In the early 20s. In the early 20s, <laughs> yeah. they were global, international yeah. travelers. Yeah. Man. And, and they made me want to travel and, and, and play music and, and see things. You know, I'd see those posters of them on stage at Donington with all the shit on the stage, the piss oh my God. and the bottles and the mud. And that, I was like, those pictures. Those pictures. The, 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 to this day, I remember where I was at my friend's house in his bedroom when he bought Master and he handed it to me and he literally put on battery. And I, I was like, oh, that's a cool front cover. And then I flipped it over, and it's Lars turned around Day like that. Green. And yeah. yeah, Day of the Green. And yeah. the, the, the crowd's in front of him. And I said, that's who I want to be. Yeah. Like, I was like, that's, there it is. That's it. You know what I mean? That and is it. That, th those pictures in the back to me are still iconic. Oh. And, uh, you know, I finally got to meet him. Um, Sparta was on tour with Queens of Stone Age in 2004. Wow. Uh, and uh, we were just... You know, we are getting we we get along really well with them. We're really close with them. We had just finished big day out with them. Josh took me to to his hotel room. We were we were partying a little bit. Was that and, songs from the death tour? Yeah. Wow. And he goes, he goes, you guys want to come to Europe? And I'm like, yeah. And I went downstairs to wherever everyone was partying at the hotel, and I went up to everyone individually. And I don't even know if I even asked. I was like, we're going on tour with Queens, okay, in Europe in about three weeks. And everyone was like, okay. And we, just, we went back to party. Hell yes. And then we, I remember we did two nights in Paris, and it was the same days that, that Metallica was playing three shows in one day in Paris for some kind of monster. Wow. Three shows in one day. Three shows in one, one day. day. So the night before we did show one with Queens and Sparta, uh, me and Troy Van Leeuwen are really close and that's where, that's the tour we became really close on. We went to a party. I run into Tom Morello. Uh, Tom buys me a drink. We start partying and I see this velvet rope. I so saw I'm in Paris and I'm like, there's audio. I'm with audio save Queens and Sparta and we're just having the best time of our lives. And as I see the velvet rope, I'm like, Tom, what's back there? He goes, oh, Metallica's back there. And then I look at Troy, and Troy nods his head. He's like, I'm not taking you back there. Because he's friends with Trujillo. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, you're taking me back there, dude. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to meet Metallica. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry. I'm going to meet him. I was yeah. like a total fanboy. Yeah. And then, and then he goes, okay. So we go to the velvet rope, and he... he just by luck, runs into Trujillo. Trujillo's like, come in. And we go through the velvet rope, yeah. uh, us two and, and Morello. And then the first person I meet besides Trujillo was Kirk. Yeah. And Kirk's like, dude, I'm a big fan. Love at the drive-in. Love Volta. Love Sparta. Everything. All you guys together. I love you guys. And I was just like, he knows what we do. Like To me, right. it was just like, Kirk Hammett knows. Oh, yeah. So then I meet Lars right after that. And Lars is just a sweetheart to me. And he had to leave early that night. He's like, but tomorrow we're playing three shows. I was like, three shows? He goes, he goes, yeah, three. And they're playing all small venues. One that I just headlined with, with at the drive-in two years before. Right, you know? right. And uh, and I was like, can I go? He goes, yeah. And I was like, so I, you know, so that night I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go see Metallica in a place as big as like That's I so play. So dope, right? And uh, that's the real Metallica. Yeah. So too. I get off stage. I say bye to the Queens dudes. I'm like, have a great show. I'm out. So 
Paul and I, both Metallica heads, we take a taxi to the the venue. We watch Metallica right behind the soundboard. They start with Blackened. Yeah. And I'm just like, this is good. Lars, I see Lars after the show. He's like, I rented a bar out till 9 a.m. You want to come? And I'm all, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. so I party. I, we, <laughs> so we party with Lars all freaking night, all yeah. morning. And he is this, he is beyond generous, super nice. You know, I, I get to geek out at the same time, be a, a counterpart. He's like, I don't remember the first time we were in El Paso. I was all 1983, right? The lighting. You know, I, I was Mr. Yeah. Fact Boy, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, he started laughing, and we just had this great night. We went back to our hotel around 8.30 a.m., packed our bags, took a plane to Sweden, and played a show at 3 p.m. Uh, in Sweden that same day. I was out of my mind, and I was like, f- forever, I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm good like uh, that. Like uh, yeah, my, all my childhood was just like I was like I'm good, you know. <laughs> and luck, you know, I'm I, we're all blessed and lucky that I've had a lot of those instances in my life and with my own bands and meeting bands that I grew up listening to. You know, yeah, that's how I look at yeah. like rock and roll. Like you know, uh, without ro- my whole rock and roll life, I would have nothing no 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 great great memories i wouldn't have the show i wouldn't have my comedy career because it drove me to do it you know yeah, what i mean i bet but thanks yeah. to those downloaders thank you <laughs> those illegal downloaders uh it drove me to comedy <laughs> um let's talk a little bit about uh, now i did the uh benefit for you guys and yeah. you got some stuff going on let's talk a little bit about that yeah so um my wife and i in 2008, during the econ- economic meltdown and right when we had our son, I stopped touring with, Spar- with Sparta. She quits her job. Yeah. And we're like, what are we going to do? Yeah. You know, and uh, yeah, that's crazy. And, right? uh, like we just really we went deep. We're freaking out having a child and taking care of something that wasn't like that we had no idea how to take care of. And I said, you know what? You've helped me and like supported me and, and, and always been my biggest champion in everything I've done in, at the drive in Sparta. I go, what do you want to do? Let me help you. Now that I'm home and I'm not going to tour, I'm going to say no to any tours that get brought up to me. Like, Was there tours being brought yeah, up? Yeah, there was tours brought up, but I'm, like, I, I'm not sure how much I am the guy that like, is the hired dude because right. I, I like to take, I like to help. Did you watch Hired Gun? No, I need to watch that. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but like, I, I just I'm not saying that I never will be like I I maybe I'll, I'll welcome not having any responsibility but I love having responsibility. I got that in me too. Like yeah. I was the guy in the band, and it's hard to sit on the sidelines. And also, I, I look at it as like maybe I never got somewhere big because of that, and didn't let go of the reins and let someone else do it. But I also always felt like. Yeah, I just don't want to do that. Like what they try and you to, are who you are, right? Yeah, and they try to steer you into something like you ought to do this. It's like oh, that's fucking cheesy. Yeah, though. you know, like, yeah, but it'll make you money, and then you get. I was like, ah, you know, so yeah, yeah it's so, tough, right? So yeah, so we, you know, I, I, that was a really hard time in my life. You know, I, I didn't know what I was gonna do. Uh, everything was, you know. Our, you know, we luckily own a house and we were just like, you know, everything dropped the, you know, the housing crisis happened. Oh, yeah. the bo- it you was just high. And yeah. Now it's worth it. It was just like, it was everything was going wrong. And we have this kid that we didn't, we were just like, we couldn't handle anything. It was just a weird time in our lives. And I said, what do you want to do? She said, I want to start a business. I've always started speech. She's a speech therapist, speech programs for other companies. I've always, I was like, she's like, I want to do my own. I go, okay, what do we need to do? She's like, well, I need to write a service description. It's called, I'll bore you for a second. And it's a hundred and you know, 150 page, pretty much what we're gonna do, how we're gonna do therapy. And I just like got on the internet and I learned how to start a business. Wow. I got us the license, I got us every all the insurances you would need to work with children, hoping that we got became a vendor of it's called the uh, uh, like a regional center. California has regional centers, which is so amazing about California. Any child doesn't matter how much your parents make. If they're if you have any kind of real need, the state will pay for your services up to three years old because they feel if they help you between zero and three, they call it zero, and three years old, then you will forever you you have a better chance of not getting over and over in the system and needing help for the rest of your life. Oh wow! So she starts it, and all of a sudden she calls me one day and she goes, "We got a contract from the state." 
Wow. And and it's then, a speech therapy yeah, business. Yeah, right? yeah. So For that's kids how it started. That can't speak. Yeah, I mean from you know like stutters from from, or from, from, the, from the beginning of like of oh my kid can't say an R something very right. simple to all the way to autism and Downs and right. you know every MS everything you could think of. Um, so we got our first three clients in a week. Three clients wow. and and Nicole went into their homes and. And that's how we lived on those three clients. And I would just, so the I would government bill everyone. pays her the state. And, and, yeah, the and state. then the, and then the people, yeah, the state and then the people that get it for free. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that was a, that was a November of 2008, right? Three months after we made the decision. And all of a sudden those three clients became six and then became nine. We hired our first employee. Uh, a year later, we get our first office. A year after that, we, we get a second office in the same building and fast forward to uh, the beginning of 2016 when we met. A month before, we we get a, a, a 10,000 square foot building and we start renovation. Wow! And um, here we are, nine years later, we have 43 employees. Wow! Over 500 clients. Whoa! And we just opened a private preschool. Uh, Smile is the occupational therapy and speech therapy and autism services side of the company and wonder is the new preschool private preschool that which is all inclusive all kinds of kids and so we call it smile and wonder and we just wanted to be this little as one client calls it it's literally the unicorn in the middle of beverly boulevard wow. we're on beverly and vendome you know we have murals all over the building we 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 cut we we keep it rock and roll. We keep it artistic. Yeah. And you walk in, and we we've we've literally gone through like almost to every nail and made it this magical wonderland for children. That's including, amazing. Including our own, and we have this amazing big playground. You know, and we you know at the drive-in when we decided to get back together, Paul literally nudges me in the hotel in October of 2015 because he knew I was doing I was planning a benefit. Yeah, yeah. And he goes, "You better ask them." And we better do it. That better be our first show. Wow. Your benefit. The, the benefit. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I'm not going to ask people to do that for me. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to ask people to play a show and then give my company the money. Yeah. And he's like, and then I, I remember I talked to Josh Homme because he's done a lot of benefits and I wanted his, his advice. And he goes, he goes, it's not like you're asking people for money so you could go uh, yeah, on, on vacation. vacation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, yeah. Like, he's like, what you do is freaking important. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And so that gave me the guts to even ask my band members because I'm that guy that doesn't want to ask for a favor from anyone. And I asked my band members, even before we even decided to play a show, I go, if we play a show, I'm planning this benefit. And it works out with our schedule. It's in March. Yeah. And then no one even blinked for half a second in that room when I asked. Omar and Cedric and Paul were in the room. And they're, they're like, that's the first show. Oh, it's so cool. Yeah. And it so, was magic. Yeah. And it was, you were there. And again, thank you for emceeing it. Absolutely. And it, was, and it was an it, honor. It was a great, fun show. And here we are. Uh, in uh, February of next year, we're going to do another one. That's uh, but this time we're going into a, a, a gallery show. We're doing yeah. a gallery show inside the new facility, so we're going to invite people to the new facility. And we got all these amazing artists and musicians that do art to donate pieces. Wow! And we're going to who do you got like who? Like we're we're going to do a big announcement uh, next week. But awesome. I, but I'll tell you some stuff. It's. Um, Kat Von D signed up to do art. Right. Shepard Ferry signed up. Wow. Uh, Jose Pasillas from Incubus, who's a great artist. Right. He's, he donated some stuff. Um, of course, Cedric is a great artist. He's doing Incredible. some stuff. Uh, the drummer of, uh, uh, you know, Gojira. Oh, uh, I love that band. Jeff Amit. Uh, oh, wow. Like, like, so we, and that's just the art side. And then yeah. I, they're like, going to donate like drawings pieces and paintings of art. Yeah. That people yeah. can bid and, on. And, and, and yeah, so wow. be auctioned for that. And then we, like, I won't even get into the amazing stuff we got donated for the silent auction. Yeah. So this time we're going the other way. We're not going big rock show. Yeah, yeah. And then Gone is Gone, my other project with Tro Troy Van Leeuwen of Queens and Troy Sanders of Mastodon. We're going to do like this weird eclectic set in the in the playground area of ironically enough oh that's cool and um so i invite you so we're gonna do I'm there and uh and so that's you know we're 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 taking it another way like nicole's like you're the head of fundraising i was like i don't want to be the head of fundraising yeah, was, yeah. you're really good at it <laughs> and uh so now i've become that guy um but i'm really excited because of my management raw power management without them this this one and the last one wouldn't have happened they literally stepped in and have taken over they don't have to help me on this side of my life right at all yeah you know, i don't pay them for this or you know and they've done literally taken over and they've put this whole gallery show together for me that's right when is it so it's 
You know, I'm. It's either going to be February eighth or February tenth. Can people go? Like, yeah, we're, gonna, we're it's going to start private for like an hour and a half, right? And then it's going to be open to the public. Kind and of is there a website or anything? We're going to go- all that's getting built, and uh, it's. Uh, I'll be. I'll have announcements, and I would love for you to repost stuff eventually I'll, too. I'll, absolutely. Yeah, and, and uh, it- yeah, we're gonna we're. You know, you're getting the news before anyone else, and uh, and I'll shout it out on the podcast a couple yeah. of weeks uh, before. Yeah, yeah. Just so, so people can get tickets. It's and gonna go. be fun, and the artwork I've you know I've seen probably sixty percent of it, and it's amazing stuff. And it's just we're so humbled. Wow, that's so great. Like people, and you are, guys are doing a good thing, man. Thank you. I mean, yeah, we're man. it's it's not easy. It's it's a very hard hard job. And most of the weight is on my wife. Yep. And as we're growing this quickly and we continue to grow, we've doubled since last year. Yeah. And it's like, That's crazy, like right? our Christmas party was 56 people. So it's wow. like people and their, you know, their guests and stuff. And, and it's just like, when you're sitting there and, and my wife is making a speech in front of everyone, I was like, I got super emotional inside at least. And I was just like, you know, we, these people help so many kids in need. Yeah. Again, absolutely, man. You know, I mean, you know, speech Without it, you're yeah. just fucked. And without speech, you don't have feeding. You don't eat properly. Yeah. Without, you know, your right proper movements of your tongue. You know, it's, it sounds weird, but like even when you're older and you have a stroke and you can't use your tongue, Absolutely. you can't speak and you can't eat. Yep. So imagine that on a child. And, and it goes, again, we, we help the, the most minimal problems to the biggest problems at Smile. And wonder for us is just this, you know, it's the it's the fruit of the labor because it's it's just it's just fun. It's a preschool. You yeah, know what I mean, it's like that's the, rad. You know, it's just kids having fun and learning when they don't think they're learning. You know, it, it's so cool, man. It's yeah. so cool to do that. So that's that's the other side of my brain, and I get to use my math degree for yeah. for payroll. And the, the band always makes fun of me. I'm backstage <laughs> doing payroll like right before a festival or something. Payroll, <laughs> and Hilarious. then we were recording the Gone Is Gone record. Yeah, and Troy Van Leeuwen would always come, and he's like, "Oh, it's Tuesday." Um, you doing payroll, Tony? I'm like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it's like I, you know, I always say I get to use both sides of my brain. And uh, you know, jokes aside, I'm I'm very lucky to have to be able to do both these things. Yeah, and, yeah man. And, and have it, and I still get to play in a rock band and be yeah. obnoxious and and, and be have loud a life also and like have this whole different life. Not be completely scared of like, what if we uh, don't play for another five years? Yeah, you know I, I, mean? I, you know, that's. The thing is, I, I grew up so freaking poor that uh, I've I always have a backup plan. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, the first time I didn't have a backup plan is right when we had our son, and we we're uh, what I just shared earlier, and we were shedding bricks like about like what we we're right. going to do, and uh, you know that was the only time I didn't have a backup plan. I was like, I always had a backup plan, you know, yeah. you know. So, what are the plans now for uh, driving? You guys are home now. We're home now. We you have taken a, a long time off, or no, what? we're taking. We're yeah. we're st- we're playing. We're doing stuff. We're already booking stuff and announcing stuff for 2018. Wow. We're announcing festivals in July. We have a tour, uh, UK Europe with uh, De- Death from Above 1979 and oh, the yeah. Butcherettes that starts in the middle of February next year, right after the benefit. No shit. Uh, Is that states? No, that's Europe. Okay. And then uh, and then you know uh, we're, we'll end the campaign mid to late next year for Inter Alia and uh, uh, Diamante the the EP. So. We're working, man. That's three years. God. And then we're gonna take a real break and you know, and we're planning the future. That's yeah, that's yeah. how positive everything is for us right now. That's rad, man. Yeah. I'm so glad it's happening. Thank you know you. what I mean? Because uh it's a lot like Primus. I've been I've been telling people if you've never seen Drive-In or Primus, you have to go see these bands that are out there that are outside the box, you know what I mean? And the uh, the you know, I was watching an ACDC clip uh, yesterday. I posted it up and I said, before you tell me how this band's bringing back rock, tell me if it's up to this or you know what I mean? And I really, the power coming off that fucking shit video clip, oh it reminds me of the power of At The Drive-In, man. Thank you. When it comes on, it's like, whoa, fuck. And, and I don't think I've seen an audience as great as your guys' audience ever. You know, as far as like singing the lyrics, I mean, I was standing on stage a few times seeing you this year, and it, it, the the lyrics coming off from the crowd is louder than the the wow. fucking mains, man. It's like this is incredible. There's the, your fans are what people dream of, you know. Like I, we are I, very lucky. I'm at that part in my career right now where I can't figure out how to get fanatics 
where people are like, I'm there no matter what. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? And it's a magic thing. It touches people in the right way to where they need to go to your show. And they have man, to be a part of it. Yeah. And man, when I go to those, it's like, see you guys. I'm like, these guys are your gold for the rest of your life. I mean, we, we're, we've we been lucky because you know our, our record all that time we were uh, not a band was handed down. Yeah. And uh, it you know, really is. Yeah. Relationship of Command was handed down. And those people that got relationship and understood it, then they went deeper and got the other records. And, you know, you don't know how many people I met that were like, I couldn't see you the first time around. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm glad you came to this show. He's like, and they'd be like, yeah, I was four. Or, yeah. you know, <laughs> you know and, yeah. hey, why weren't you there before? Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. Oh, I was two. Because I, I was a little, I was yeah. a child. Uh, yeah. No, but the thing is, like, to, you know, to have that. I don't look at it in a way as might some people might have taken that comment in the sense of like, like oh I'm I'm getting old. No, I take it in a way like that's rock and roll. Yeah. I take it in a positive light. I talk. I take it in the, in the sense of that that's what rock and roll is about. It gets handed down. Yeah. And if you ACDC, I got I got I got handed down. I got handed at, handed down ACDC and Zeppelin. Yeah. Even though they were you know three i was three generations apart from them yep. you know like i got handed down those bands and if and if it wasn't for that and it wasn't for my friend literally handing me master on 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 vinyl yeah then i like that that stuff that never would have happened nope and it, it's and, true and i'm i'm into that and i love that our sometimes i'm in watching the audience because i love to watch the audience because i'm a drummer and i get to just sit there yeah um you know and it's like i see i see 10 year olds singing songs off in casino out and then i see People, you know, either either half my age or my age, and they're doing the same thing, and so that's how I don't feel like a band that got back together. Right. You know, I don't call it reunion anymore. It's it's a union. We're back. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. You like, guys, you guys, we did that. You guys just fucking, you know, went some separate ways for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. When you're playing something that intense, it's gonna combust. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and you know when something feels like a reunion, you see it, you feel it when you're watching. Yeah. And then you feel, and then you also feel when you're like, oh, these guys are. You know, they're serious. Yeah, it's so you know? good, man. Well, yeah. I, I can't thank you enough for doing the show. Uh, and, and We've been talking about it for about a, a year and a half now. I know. Hilarious. <laughs> yeah. You know what's funny is that's how this show goes, though. It's like, well, one day it's going to happen. It's going to be perfect timing. <laughs> yes. And exactly. here it is. It's perfect timing. You know what I'm saying? You ever Did you have any Spinal Tap moments on this run? Like <laughs> fucking, you know, like, oh, God, I went up there in the, you know, such and such or whatever, anything? No, I mean, I, the, the weirdest thing I ever ha I had happened to me, we were playing Mexico first time in Mexico City. It's a massive show. Yeah. Like this, you know, mini arena, like, you know, you know 5,000 people just oh, for I, us. That was after the shrine, right? Yeah, yeah. It, was, yeah it was after yeah. the shrine. And Omar and I are like on cloud nine. They were playing Mexico City. For him, it was, it's his old hometown. He lived yeah. there for a bit. For me, it's just like, we're just, we're like giddy hugging each other before the show. We were so excited about it. And him and I, of all the two that, that were all giddy and so excited, we have literally the worst shows of our, of our life. I'm playing half the set and half the set, there's, there's so much craziness happening in my in ears. Yeah. So this is what I'm hearing in my in ears. <laughs> Full blast. And Whoa. then the stage is so big that if I pop out my ears, I don't hear anything but my cymbals. Whoa. And I'm like literally like almost like in tears that I've like I've worked this show up so high. Yeah. And I'm literally having the worst now show of my nightmare. life. And then everyone's looking at me because I, I I don't know where I am. Yeah. Like I literally like it and and I was just literally the whole set, my in ears were <laughs> I like, think that was no. Ross Robinson coming back at you. <laughs> so, so what'd you say about I'll, me? I'll show you, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, revenge. <laughs> Did you make it through? Like it, I made it through, and I, I, you know, I don't break things anymore. But that yeah. was that, that was like the first night in about 10, 15 years that I broke a lot of shit walking <laughs> off stage. Because <laughs> it was just like I'm, I'm we're finally playing Mexico what City is at the drive-in. Like we've played yeah. it in all our other bands and had great shows there, and we finally doing it as this band, like. You know, five thousand people there just for us. Pepsi yeah. Center, like it's just like we're on cloud nine. It's literally the worst show oh, ever for Omar the worst. and I. <laughs> like I love Omar. He'll text me like every few months, like at like three in the morning. <laughs> yes, and he'll be like, "We need to get together and hang." I'm like, "Well, well let's fucking do it." Dude. <laughs> you know? I'm like, "Oh, I that's love his that's his waking hours. Those are my sleeping hours." Oh yeah, I love I love it because it'll come out of nowhere, and I know to me it's like, "Oh, he's sitting somewhere." <laughs> he's working. That's yeah, what he's, he's doing. Working, and then he's yeah. like, "Wonder what Dean's up to." You know? <laughs> 
<laughs> it's great. Well, uh, what's your Instagram again? Tell everybody. Uh, Tony Hajar, H-A-J-J-A-R-1, the number one. And uh, you got uh, Twitter. You do that? No. No, I I do have an account, the same name, but I've uh, yeah, just, slowly like stopped using it. I just yeah. like, Twitter's becoming more and more of a place of like being mean. Oh, it's just a part two of Facebook. Yeah, man. and it's like, just, and it's just like I, you know what? I still love it's like just if, politics if, beat. Down. Yeah, if you could love and a social media, yeah. I love that Instagram. At least it's like a, it's still arty, and it, you can Instra- show a picture. And, Instagram yeah. is what it's about for yeah. me. It's yeah. just photos. And happiness, and it's know? not that much negativity. Like nope. you'll get a few comments of negativity here and there, yeah. but it's like Twitter's like for some reason people are like, "This is where I'm going to destroy you." It's turned you know? into a garbage can. Yeah, it, yeah, really, it really has. has. Yeah, and uh, you know with that net neutrality thing passing which is, today, oh god, which is fucking nightmare, nightmare. People, people, you know, they like, don't understand. They don't. It's <laughs> like it's almost like uh, I was saying, rock dummy in the band. Like, how come I don't have any money? People are going to be like. How come I got to pay $120 <laughs> for uh, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram? Yeah, now? Welcome to the future. Holy shit. You know, and yeah. I think it might be better, maybe, that we go back and we look at each other and just talk while we're eating no, lunch or I, whatever. I you're mean, right. I'm, I'm addicted to social media. Yeah. I absolutely, you know, but I also have an addictive personality, you know? Yeah. And I know I can kick it. I'm that kind of guy, you know, but blow, booze, cigarettes, yeah. see you later, sugar, fucking yeah. out of here. Yeah. And if I wasn't in the biz, oh, I'd never be on. I would just be living in Joshua Tree, yeah. fucking riding dirt bikes and uh, off the grid to completely. Yeah, you know? I mean, I, I'm not addicted to social media. I'm, I'm addicted to my phone, right. as most people are. I've made a, made a thing like, you know, we're segueing here a little bit, but like, yeah, I've made a thing like I literally just put my phone down at 8 p.m. and I yeah. don't pick it up at all. Right. So even if a phone call comes, an important email, I'll I'll, I'll check it in the morning. Yeah, because that's what we did back in the day. Yeah, that's what you did. We came home, we listened to the recorder. Yeah. Beep, if can you do this gig tomorrow? <laughs> yeah. Beep, hey, man, I stopped by earlier. You weren't there. It's, you know what I yeah. mean? Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's the thing. Like, And if it's important enough, someone will call you eight times in a row. You know? Well, I probably would never look at my phone if I had work booked for the next two years. Yeah. I'd be like, well, I've got work. Yeah. But since I'm always looking for work, yeah. then I'm looking at it like, oh, shit, a gig tomorrow night yeah. just came Let's go up. Do it. But if yeah. I had work, I'd be like, all right, there it is. I'm not looking at the phone anymore. Yeah, exactly. Well, thanks for doing the show. Thank dude. you so much, Dean. I yeah. really appreciate what a you. Great, and- uh, great, uh, some stories you hit on here, yeah. man. Yeah, you got some good ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thank you, Dean, and thanks for what you do. And again, thanks for your help with you know the other side of my life and smile. I really oh, yeah, appreciate it. I, I can't wait to go to this uh, thing in February. Yeah, thank it, you so it'll much. It'll be great, man. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in. And uh, don't forget to uh, subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. That's how we keep the show in the top 100 on iTunes. And also, leave that review. I'm at 951. I want to get to 1,000. See you guys. Candles lit.